Okay, so I'm going to get started. Um, today's announcements are the, the sapling chapter 5 is due Monday 9 a.m. Um, exam review is Sunday afternoon, 3 to 5 p.m. in Duane G1B20, same as before. And I do have lecture capture set up, um, so if you can't make it, you can still watch. And then the exam is Tuesday, 7 to 9 p.m. in Chem 140. Um, plan is for me to have finished Chapter 6 by that point, and it looks like we're on track to do that. So it'll cover up through the end of Chapter 6. Okay, so um, Chapter 6 sapling is already open if you want to go in and get a head start, but um, that won't be due until after the exam. Okay, any questions about those things? Okay, cool. Alrighty, so what we started on last time was just a little bit out of Chapter 6. Um, kind of like I mentioned, we're taking a brief break from all of the new reactions we saw in 4 and 5 and spending a little while looking at geometry again. Okay, so what we saw last time is that it's possible to have two molecules with the same connectivity, so like these two models that I brought in last time, um, where everything's connected to atoms in the same order, but you still can't make them overlap with each other. They're non-superimposable. So enantiomers um, means non-superimposable, or in other words, non-overlappable or non-congruent mirror images. All right, so um, just for those of you who missed last lecture and haven't caught up yet, um, the example that I used is if you've got these two models here, imagine like there's a mirror wall right here um, cutting between these two models. So like this thing is looking at its reflection in this mirror. Um, the red reflects into red, purple reflects into purple, yellow into yellow, green into green. So they're mirror images. But if I try to overlap them, if I try to get like the two molecules like overlapping exactly in space, it's never going to work because I'm always going to have two of the atoms that mismatch with each other. So like if I line them up this way, green and yellow are swapped from where they should be. Or I could do like maybe I'll get green and purple to match up, but now red and yellow are going to be a problem. So um, I guess two take-home things from this. One is that if you want to sort of convert one of these models to its mirror image, all you have to do is pop off two of the atoms, say like purple and red, and swap them with each other. So doing that means that now I can overlap them with each other. Um, but now they're no longer mirror images. I've converted them to the same molecule. <coughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> the other take-home thing is that the word that we use to describe these molecules um, that have this relationship with each other is chiral. <clears throat> and this is from the Greek word for hand. So chiral literally means like they have a handedness. <clears throat> And the reason it's called that is because if you look at your two hands, these are both chiral. They're mirror images of each other, like my left reflects into my right hand. But no matter how I like <clears throat> twist and turn and flip them around, I'm never going to be able to turn my left hand into my right hand or vice versa. Like they're non-superimposable, but they're still mirror images of each other. OK. So. Um, there's a few ways to check whether something is chiral. One is actually draw or build a model of the mirror image and see whether you can make it overlap. That's kind <clears> of <throat> a good place to start. But there is actually an easier way to check. So the easiest way to check for chirality is look for an internal mirror plane of symmetry. <clears throat> so 
So if it exists, in other words, if one half of the molecule reflects into the other half, um, depending on where you slice it, then the molecule is not chiral. Um, here's where the terminology is a little annoying for this chapter. Um, not chiral, the word that we use for that is achiral, which means I have to be very careful when I'm lecturing to distinguish between an achiral molecule and a space chiral molecule. So I'm going to try to put a pause in there, but if it's not clear, please raise your hand and ask. Um, it's an important distinction, and you don't want to get sort of the wrong idea from just my poor phrasing and timing. OK. <clears throat> so some examples of how this looks. If I have, say, a six-membered ring here, and I have a CH3 sticking off of it, I can slice this molecule in half in such a way that every half, every part of the molecule on one side reflects into a part of the molecule on the other side. So I can slice this thing right down the middle vertically, and it doesn't matter if an atom ends up like entirely on one side of the plane or if it ends up half on one side or half in the other, or half in one side and half in the other. Um, as long as it's still reflecting perfectly into the other side, we're good. So in this case, like these two carbons out on the left reflect into these two on the right. This one here reflects into like the other half of itself. This one here reflects into the other half of itself. This one here reflects into the other half of itself. And then the H's here, I'm not drawing exactly where they're pointing, but we know we have rotational freedom in this bond here. So this CH3 methyl group can like spin around however it wants. And we can find a way for it to point. For example, I could draw like H, 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 if you want to get real specific about it, in such a way that the H's can also reflect into either a different H or their other half. So usually, like, side groups like this, if they're freely rotating, we're not even going to bother elaborating on the structure in there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If the carbon is bonded to a ring by a double bond, would that have to be considered um, So, good question. So if we draw the same thing with a double bond here, so um, in this case, it would end up with the carbon having two H's coming off of it. Um, and whether that happens to mean that they're sticking up to left and right, we still have symmetry. Or what's actually going to be the case is, and we'll look a little bit more at rings in the next chapter, and this will sort of make more sense. But what's actually going to be the geometry here is, One's going to be bold, sticking straight up towards you. One's going to be dashed, going straight into the page. And so now if we cut it in half, even though, again, I'm doing that, like, splaying out the bold and dashed bonds a little bit so we can see both of them, the line that I draw, like the mirror plane, would still, like, chop this H in half by itself and this H in half by itself. So it does still end up being symmetrical. OK. So yeah, no matter how the geometry on that ends up, um, turns out we still get a mirror plane in this guy. So, OK. Um, so questions about these three examples before I do a couple more? Yeah? When you have n groups, is mm -hmm. there ever a point in which the geometry of the n group will matter because it's chiral? So as long as it's freely rotating, which we're kind of assuming that it is on single bonds, then no, because as long as it's got you know, some pair of atoms that can reflect into each other here, then we can still slice the group in half. Um, I guess being an N group or not doesn't matter too much. What does matter is um, whether the carbon has four different things attached to it. So we'll go into that in just a little bit of more detail in just a second here. Um, let me do just a couple more examples of like looking for mirror planes first, though. <clears throat> okay, so here's one where we have bold OH and bold OH. OK, so I won't be able to draw a mirror plane vertically, like the same as I did over here. But I can still slice this in thing, thing in half and chop it that way. So now, again, um, this carbon reflects into its other half. This bold OH reflects into this bold OH here. 
So this is symmetrical. Um, this is a mirror plane where everything reflects into everything else. OK, so all these things have a mirror plane, which means they're achiral. OK, one example where this doesn't work is something like this. You may be tempted to say, OK, why don't I just slice down between the fluorines, cut it in half that way. Problem is, if I try doing that, then I'm trying to reflect a bold F into a dashed F. That's not actually a mirror image. It's like this bold F should reflect into a bold F over here if I'm drawing a, a mirror plane perpendicular to the board like this. So this is not actually a mirror plane. This molecule is chiral, and it has a handedness to it. OK. So um, the part of the molecule that is actually causing chirality to arise in all these cases um, is about you know, 90 plus percent of the time in this chapter going to be caused by something that's called an asymmetric carbon. or I guess more generally an asymmetric atom, but it's almost always carbon. So this is going to be a carbon with four different groups attached. OK, so for instance here, this carbon is um, carrying one attachment to the ring if you go counterclockwise, a different looking attachment to the ring if you go counterclock or if you go clockwise versus counterclockwise, and then it's got a bold F and a dashed H. So this is one example of an asymmetric carbon. It's got four different things attached to it. So traversing the ring in two different directions ends up counting as two different groups, assuming that your path looks different depending on which way you go. So if I go clockwise, I'm hitting just a CH2 first. If I go counterclockwise, I'm hitting an F and an H on that carbon. OK, so asymmetric carbons are actually one sort of subtype and it's the most common type. of stereocenter. And we've seen one example of stereocenters before when we looked at E and Z alkenes. But the official definition is any place where swapping two groups gets you a different molecule. Okay, so that's kind of what I was showing here with these models, where if I flip like two of the colored balls around, then I can go from having the mirror image like this um, versus having two identical copies. A question? Uh, could you repeat the name or just the chemical formula of the uh, chiral group? Mm -hmm. Would we have to know that one chlorine is connected to the other chlorine? Ah. Excellent question. So that's actually what most of the next page of the notes about is how do we actually include some information in the name about what direction stuff's pointing. So for this, we're actually going to have to default to um, some new descriptors to show like how the geometry is arranged at each asymmetric carbon. Um, so what we're getting into here is called absolute configuration. <clears throat> OK, so um, turns out there's actually 
pretty much only two different ways a given asymmetric carbon can be set up. I guess for this case, I could have like, I don't know, this particular arrangement or this particular arrangement, and I can interconvert between them by swapping two of the balls. Um, the way that we're going to describe these configurations is with a descriptor that's either R or S. Um, I think that's from Latin for like right-handed and left-handed. It's like rectus versus sinistris or something. I don't, I don't know Latin, but something along those lines. <laughs> I think that's where sinister comes from is left-handed, um, which as a left-handed person, hey. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so how do we actually figure out which label we're going to pin on a molecule or on a given asymmetric carbon? Um, so to figure this out, first of all, we need to figure out where the asymmetric carbons actually are. So if I need asymmetric carbon, and traditionally we're going to label that with a star or asterisk. Um, I like asterisks. Okay. Um, you can actually save yourself a fair bit of work during this step if you recognize that um, having two copies of the same group coming off of something immediately disqualifies it from being asymmetric. So if something has two H's or three H's, it cannot possibly be asymmetric. Um, so in other words, CH2 groups in the middle of a chain and methyl groups at the end of a chain are never going to be asymmetric. So they have two to three H's each, which means multiple copies of the same group, which means they can't have four different groups. Okay. So then for each asymmetric carbon, what we're going to do is so at each asymmetric carbon, we're going to assign priorities to the four groups coming off of it, the same as we did when we were assigning priorities for E and Z alkenes. The difference is for alkenes, we only had to assign like two groups versus each other, so we did like high and low priority. Here we got four groups all competing for like first place, second place, third place, and fourth place. Um, so we're going to be using the same Conningold prelog rules that we saw in chapter four. All right, so if that is still a little bit fiddly for you and takes a little bit of work, um, this is sort of a good opportunity to get more practice because we're going to be seeing these rules even in sort of more heavy use this time. Okay, um, so just like before for E and Z alkenes, we start at the asymmetric carbon. We move out one step at a time, compare all four groups at the first atom. If we still have ties, we move out one more step, compare the next atom out. And if we have to, we can keep spreading out from there until we hit a point of difference. Okay. And then we're going to have to do something that we didn't have to do for E and Z alkenes. And this part is where three-dimensional visualizing really comes in handy or having a model kit. But I'll also show you guys a workaround so that you can get away with not having either of those skills potentially. Um, Okay, so we're going to orient the molecule, or the asymmetric carbon. So group four, the lowest priority. Is in back, or pointed away from you. Then we're going to travel in a circle that takes us from priority one to two to three. One, 
to two, to three, back to one. Do not include four in your circle. Four is pointing away from you. We just want to go in a loop that includes the other three high priority groups. Um, if that travel takes you in a clockwise direction, the molecule or the asymmetric carbon is described as R. If that travel takes you in a counterclockwise direction, it's S. OK. So let's work through some examples to get the hang of this. OK. Um, in the notes, I draw these molecules pretty big just so I can fit some descriptors and like arrows for travel on there. OK. So let's do fluorine, bromine, chlorine, and CH3. OK, again, note that I'm showing two groups in plane, one group bold, one group dashed, and the bold and dashed groups are on the outside of the angle for this to be valid tetrahedral geometry. OK, so assigning priorities. I start with my asymmetric carbon. That's that one there. Um, it's got four different groups coming off of it, a Br, an F, a CH3, and a Cl. Um, I move out one step from the asymmetric carbon in all four directions and compare. So right off the bat, I got bromine versus chlorine versus F versus carbon. That right there is enough to sort of let me assign priorities. So bromine is one, chlorine's two, fluorine's three, and the methyl group is last. OK, so any questions about that so far? Yeah. Yep, so just like it was for E and Z alkenes, higher atomic number means higher priority. So um, I move out one step and compare the atom that I have at the end of the first bond out. And bromine is the highest atomic number, then chlorine is the next highest, and then fluorine is the next highest, and then carbon. So um, that right there, like just after one step out from the center, I immediately have enough basis to figure out what ranking things go in. Question? Um, not explicitly, I'm just doing it like for this example just to make it clear what I'm doing. But yeah, I would have been totally within my rights to just show the dashed bond going off to nowhere because it's implied the end of the segment is still a CH3. Yeah, so if you do see that, um, at least while you're getting the hang of this, you may even want to explicitly draw in carbons um, so that it's easier to keep track. So, okay, thanks. Good question. Okay, cool. So I got my priorities assigned. One, two, three, four. Um, now what I want to do is get group four in the back pointed away from me. Fortunately, I set this example up, so that's already true, actually. Group four is already on a dashed bond. It's already pointed away from me. So I don't have to do anything there. So now I'm all set up to go traveling one to two to three. Back to one. Am I going clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise, right? So counterclockwise means this molecule is S. OK. Um, so questions about what I'm doing there so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm, yep. Yep, I definitely will of like how to manage if I have to do something extra to get this point in the right direction. Yep. Um, okay, cool. It looks like that's a couple examples in from here. So I'll do like a couple more regular ones first where I'm comparing priorities on different groups and then I'll show how to do this like fake swap thing. Okay, um, so any other questions about this one first? Yeah. Um, well, I guess like so long as you get group four in the back, then there's only three other groups, so you pretty much have to go like either counterclockwise or clockwise to travel the other three. Yeah. If, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I guess that's kind of lucky that carbon is tetrahedral, so there's only four total groups on there. Yep. <laughs> okay, so one more example at looking at a little bit more um, like complicated assigning priorities. <laughs> okay, so here's one. Um, looking at this, I'm trying to figure out where my asymmetric carbons are. I can immediately rule out this one, that's a CH3. I can rule out this one, that's a CH2. This one is looking very suspect. Um, also as a rule of thumb, if you're trying to figure out where the asymmetric carbons are, if I give you bold and dashed on, a on an atom, um, that's not a guarantee it's asymmetric. I might just be messing with you. Um, but <laughs> it is definitely a first place of suspicion for where you should start checking, is this an asymmetric carbon? So go in and check, okay, I got an H, I got a methyl, I got an ethyl over here, and I got this vinyl group over here. So yeah, that's four different groups. That's asymmetric. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that there and you instead have a CH2 and CH1 group, would that count as two identical Yeah. Yes, yeah, so just to show what Anne is asking about, like, I, I think this is what you're asking, but if I had like CH3 and H here. Yep, yes, yeah, so now these two groups are the same. And so this is not asymmetric carbon, which means it's achiral. Okay, one more question. Mm -hmm. Nope, so yeah, good question. So pretty much the rule is as long as there's any difference, as long as you go out far enough, then they still count as different groups. So like if I had like some million carbon chain or something. Sorry, let me count in. One, two, three, four, five. So if I had like this and some like really long chain and then at the end this one has like a surprise fluorine out at the end, those still count as two different groups. No matter how far you have to go, as long as you hit a difference eventually, it's still two different groups. Mm -hmm. What is like, um, yep, so then that would be different because now you have, uh, sorry, let me go in here. Yep, because now you have a two carbon chain versus a three carbon chain, so they're still different. Yes, yeah, so as long as you have like a difference somewhere eventually, they still count as different groups. Um, but if you like go out all the way to the end of the chain or whatever group and they end up being identical, then um, they don't count as different groups. Yeah. Okay, good. So any other questions about these sort of examples of like what counts as different? Okay, cool. I guess another way, if you're not sure to apply it, is we know the counting gold prelog rules now. So it's pretty much like move out one step, compare, move out one step, compare. Keep doing that until you hit a point of difference, if any. So on, I'll get my other hand free here. Um, Starting at this asymmetric carbon, we move out one step from here in four directions, and we got carbon versus carbon versus carbon versus H. So H immediately loses its last place. That's priority four. Oh, um, while I'm thinking of it, by the way, I tend to circle my numbers that I'm using next to these groups just because it makes it a little bit easier to keep them straight from like thinking it's a three from like a CH3 group or something like that. that um, whatever works for you, different colored ink or whatever um, is fine too. Okay, so I've moved out one step. I got carbon versus carbon versus carbon. Um, then, just like when I was doing E and Z alkenes before, I'm going to have to elaborate on that a little bit more. So this carbon, um, as we move out further from there, it has a C and an H and an H. This one has what counts as two bonds to carbon. If you remember, double bonds count as two copies of that atom. This one has C and C and H. And then this one has H and H and H. Okay, so out of them, we just want to look for the highest atomic number at first point of difference, which means that this one has a carbon, this one has a carbon, that's tied. This one has a carbon, this one has an H. So this side, the right direction ends up winning priority one. So this whole group is first priority. And then this whole group ends up in second place. This one ends up in third. 
OK, so it's pretty much the same as for E and Z and alkenes. It's just it's um, a competition between more groups this time. OK, um, questions about that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so we go, um, now that we've got, okay, I guess first of all, let's double check that we've got group four in the back, which we do, I drew it as a dashed bond for this example. So now again, we go one to two to three back to one. We're going counterclockwise again. Counterclockwise gives us S on this molecule again. Okay, good. All right, so one more like this, and then we can look at what to do if group four is not in back. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so here's one. Um, I'm actually kind of ignoring the fact for this example that um, this is not actually <clears throat> the only asymmetric carbon in the molecule. So it is asymmetric. Anywhere there's bold and dash drawn in, probably check there first. So the four different groups are OH, CH3, um, traveling in the ring this direction, which looks different from traveling in the ring this direction. Um, what I'm kind of glossing over is the fact that here, this is technically also an asymmetric carbon because Traveling around the ring that way looks different from that way, looks different from that way, looks different from the H that's also attached. And same thing down here, actually. But given that I haven't drawn anything bold or dashed coming off of here, can I tell whether these two carbons are R or S? Yeah, I see people shaking their heads, and they're correct. No, you cannot, unless I give you some information about like what the actual spatial geometry is on here. I can't figure out anything about these. So I'm going to ignore these two for now and just focus on this one. I see a hand over there. Mm -hmm. um, so the same reason that I did similar thing up here, I'm looking at this carbon, and attached to it, it has a carbon and an H and an H. And this guy has, attached to this guy, two bonds to a carbon, so like carbon and carbon, and then also an H coming off. Yeah, so when I say has, I mean like as you move further out from the center, what all is sprouting off of this thing? So, welcome. Okay, so good. Other questions about this one so far? So, okay, cool. All right, so again on this one, I'm looking one step out from the asymmetric carbon that I'm focusing on, and I'm seeing oxygen versus carbon versus carbon versus carbon. Oxygen immediately wins, and then I'm down to carbon versus carbon versus carbon. I look at this and I say, okay, it has H, 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 whereas this one has C, H, and H, and this one has C, C, and H. So it actually ends up being pretty similar to what I had in the previous example, where this group ends up priority one, this is two, this is three, and oh, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Forgot that oxygen had already taken first place. Okay, so that means this gets bumped down to second place, third, fourth. Yep, sorry about that confusion. Okay. So, all right, so now group four, the CH3 is in back, so we're good to go there. And I go one to two to three, back to one, going counterclockwise still. Um, I should really flip some of these examples so I have types of both. But all three of these turn out just by chance of how I set them up to end up being S. Okay. So, um, what do we do if we don't happen to be lucky enough that group four is already in the back? How to deal? Okay, 
So the easiest option, if you have a model kit on you, might just be make a model kit, spin it around, look at it so the group four is actually in back. Um, or if you're good at visualizing things from different sort of spatial orientations, you could imagine, okay, maybe I'm hovering like over here in the plane of the board and I'm looking down on this thing from over here, what direction do I have to spin things to go clockwise or counterclockwise? Um, but if neither of those options works, we do actually have a good third option. Um, and that's called sort of a fake swap. All right, so this is taking advantage of the fact that we already know that at any stereo center, swapping two groups gives you the opposite handedness of molecule, right? So what if I just pretend to swap two groups, like flip whatever group four is with whatever's in back, and then I'll end up getting an answer for like R or S, but then I know because I had to swap two groups to make that happen, the original molecule was the opposite of that. So just to write that down, swap group four with whatever's in back. Then we can assign R or S. And then we're going to flip it to the opposite because we know that we had to swap two groups to get there. Okay. <clears throat> so, how that's going to look. Um, you don't even have to redraw the groups themselves, just pin different numbers on them temporarily. Okay, so let's do this one. BR and F. Okay, so assigning my priorities, one step out from my asymmetric carbon, I got H versus carbon versus bromine versus F. So it's going to be priority four. All right, one, two, and three. Okay, so I could build a model of this. I could imagine I'm holding it or looking at the molecule such that group four is pointing away from me. So in other words, like ducking down in the plane of the board and like pretending I'm looking up from below. Um, or if I don't want to do that, what I can do is pretend I'm swapping group four with whichever group happens to be pointing away from me. So the F in this case. So I'm going to say, all right, H, you're temporarily two, and F, you're temporarily four. Let's go through our assignments, or through our uh, rotation again. So now I go one to two to three back to one. I went counterclockwise, so I'm getting that it's S. But because I had to swap two groups to do that, that tells me that it was originally R. So the real molecule that I actually drew is R, in fact. And I should get the same answer if I like build a model and double check that. Okay, so questions about what I'm doing here. I'm just sort of exploiting sort of an interesting fact about swapping groups. Uh-huh. Um, is there a way that you can actually split the inputs? Split the inputs and then the um, Sure, if you want, you can say like, okay, I'm going to move the F over to here and I'm going to move the H over to here. But really, I guess like the important thing is where the priority labels are because like once we've pinned the labels on stuff, then the groups themselves totally don't matter anymore. Um, and then it's just like, we just want to do the bare minimum of work basically to be able to figure this one out after that point. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you can't still add and still get the numbers, mm -hmm. um, you still do like the, the X, Y? Exactly, yep. Yeah. yeah, so really, 
um, yeah, whichever like amount of swappage you want to do, so long as you're making sure the labels are kind of the important thing because that's how you determine rotation direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so other questions about this example? Okay, cool. So, all right, so really the best way to get the hang of this is to practice it, but this fake swap thing is sort of a really good workaround if you have a hard time visualizing it. Um, but you may never need to use it if you can just like look at this and immediately see, okay, looking up from below, I would have to go like one to two to three, so I'm going like clockwise, so really it's R, and then I never have to even swap to anything to figure that out. Okay, so um, what do we actually do with this information once we have RS figured out? Um, note that we do this for each asymmetric carbon potentially, so if we've got a molecule with multiple asymmetric carbons, each one of them might individually be labeled R or S. Um, so once you have the absolute configuration R or S for each asymmetric carbon, um, you're going to put them in parentheses at the front of the name along with the number that says where they are. So, and put in parentheses at front of name. Okay. So, do, 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 do. So I'm going to skip going through like R and S for each of these asymmetric, actually, no, nah, might as well do it in example. Um, I got five minutes to finish this section, so that should be fine. Okay, so um, asymmetric carbons, again, primary suspects are anywhere where bold and dashed is shown. So that looks asymmetric. That looks asymmetric. Just to double check, this carbon has an ethyl group, a methyl group, this whole end of the molecule, and also an H, which is implied to be there. This carbon has an ethyl, a methyl, this whole end of the molecule, and also an H, which is implied to be there. Okay, so if I'm assigning the left one here, my priorities are ethyl is, uh, sorry, H is group four, methyl is three, ethyl is two, and the whole rest of the molecule is one. So group four is in back, fortunately, so one to two to three gives me S. Um, just out of habit, I tend to draw boxes around my S's and R's. Um, again, whatever makes them not accidentally get incorporated into the molecule for you works fine, different colored ink, whatever. Okay, so this guy is R. This guy over here, I got priorities four, three, two, and one. So I can go one, two to three. This is R. Okay, so I'm kind of speeding through that, but you can double check if you're not sure how I got there. Okay, so when we're naming this guy, um, we want to give it the same regular IUPAC name that we normally would. So start at the end, closer to the alkene. We've got carbons one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's a nonene. It is, in fact, a 1, 2, 3, 4 nonene. It's got methyls at 3, 6, 7. So 3, 7, dimethyl, 4 nonene is its IUPAC name as far as connectivity goes. What we can do is throw into parentheses at the start of the name a descriptor for what's going on at each asymmetric carbon. So we can say 3R, 1, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7S, 37 dimethyl 4-nonene. Um, we do also, for this molecule, have a descriptor for what's going on with the stereochemistry at the alkene as well. So um, is this an E or a Z alkene? Um, not quite. It's E, actually, yep, because uh, trans is 
which this alkene is, is a subset of E. Um, remember, Zusamen means, or uh, Z means there on Zizamezide. <laughs> okay, so this is an E, um, and we can actually throw that into the same set of parentheses if we want. So we can say 4E and then 7S. So that's our full set of stereochemical descriptors for this molecule, all of the E's and Z's, all of the R's and S's, and then we just sort them all by ascending order of location. Okay, so if someone gave you this name, you would be able to draw this entire structure, including all of the spatial geometry around all the stereocenters, like whether they're asymmetric carbons or whether they're alkenes. Okay, so that's a good stopping point. I'll pick up there next time.